we're going to be hearing from Fergal Anderson first of all. Fergal is from an organization called Tal of Bio. Um, so Fergal runs um, a small organic fruit and vegetable farm called Leaf and Root Farm um, in East Galway. And he's one of the founding members of Tal of Bio, uh, who we'll be hearing more about um, from Fergal in a few minutes. Um, Fergal's also been involved with Livia Campesina for many years since 2007, including three years working um, in their Brussels office. Fergal's going to be our first speaker. He's going to talk to us a little bit about food sovereignty and then he's going to tell us um, some more about Tal of Bio and what they've been up to. Um, and there'll be an opportunity then for people to ask questions to Fergal after he's finished speaking. Um, following on from Fergal then we have Wayne Frankham from Seed Savers. Um, Wayne, you're very welcome. Um, so Wayne is a community gardener, um, he's involved with uh, growing in local schools, he's involved in a community seed group called Seed Keep, um, and tonight he's going to be talking to us about his role with Irish Seed Savers and as the regional co coordinator of the Gaia Foundation, um, which is a seed sovereignty programme here in Ireland and in the UK. Um, so again, when Wayne is finished speaking, there'll be time to ask him some questions afterwards um, so that we'll have that kind of after each speaker just so that we can kind of have a little bit more interaction on the on the webinar um, and then hopefully technology allowing um, when Wayne is finished with the questions and answers we're going to have a little bit um, of a tour from from Fergal of his farm and some of the, the things that he does there um, so we'll see how that goes and uh, hopefully hopefully the technology won't fail us there and then our final speaker of the night is Sinead Moran um, so Sinead is joining us um, representing Foodture, but she's also a member of Talib Bio. Um, Sinead's background is in natural sciences and she also has a master's in climate change, agriculture and food security. Um, on top of that, Sinead is a dairy farmer in County Mayo and she is also one of the co-founders of Foodture, which is a platform for connecting citizens with um, food producers and also kind of sharing the stories of uh, food producers around Ireland. So she has a great podcast and um, lots of other things available on the Future website. So yeah, like I said, um, just a big thank you to the three of you for, for joining us and sharing your very valuable experiences and knowledge. Um, I know this is a really like very, very busy time for food producers and it's always the time that we want to do things like this. So um, thanks for taking your, your time out of your schedule. Um, I see there's still a lot of messages coming in, um, but I think we'll move on to the Fergal now and um, people can still continue to message in. And um, Fergal, I'm just going to unmute you and uh, see if you can take it away. Hello. <coughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, it's very strange to be looking at my... Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I assume, I, I'm assuming you can. Uh, just to be looking at a computer screen, uh, but these are strange times we're living in, I guess. Um, so I hope you can all hear okay, and I hope you're all doing okay, because it's in these strange times, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a lot of people are going through a lot of different things, but um, yeah, I just hope you're all doing okay. So first, a little bit of the future of food. Um, I think food production is probably the most important activity that human beings undertake on the planet, um, certainly in terms of its impact. Uh, and there's a saying that society is only three meters deep, and I think we've seen that very, uh, very clearly exposed maybe in the last, uh, in the last month or so. Um, on one side, there's been a rush to supermarkets. Um, on the other, we've seen some of the kind of frailties and contradictions um, and the exploitation involved in the industrial food system um, being exposed. Um, and uh, so the nature of that system being revealed a little bit. Um, we should remember when we look at that conventional industrial system that it's, uh, that it's really not that old. And... Um, it's relatively new and it's only emerged out of the kind of post-World War II uh, re re redirecting of industrial production of chemicals into fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, etc., um, which are incredibly energy intensive. And it's also led to a mechanization uh, of, our, of our food and agricultural production systems, which are seeing the impacts of uh, today in environmental uh, impacts and we've seen them over the course of generations. At the, at the other, at the, on the other hand, we also have to remember that um, you know resilient family farms provide uh, up to seventy percent of the food for people on the planet, um, and that all over the world they are producing food for people, while the industrial farming system is producing a lot of feed for animals and other uh, commodity crops. So 
those farmers uh, in many parts of the world on marginal land are still producing a lot of food and they're using agroecological methods and 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 there's and are sustaining a way of life so there's a there's that's all is not lost uh, yet anyway so what future would i like to see i mean the future i'd like to see for 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 land use is one where we change our, our relationship with the land pretty fundamentally and where farming e and ecosystems uh, support each other um where our human relationship with uh with nature changes to one based on dominance and control to one based on respect and dignity and balance. Um, and that's something I think we'd all uh, work for. Um, and maybe where land is managed for the benefit of the world's population as a whole uh, and not for a minority. Uh, and where cultivated wild uh, biodiversity is, is, is regenerated and, and restored. And if that sounds, I mean, that may sound idealistic, but I mean, I think, uh, you know, the times that we're living in now are a demonstration that, you know, things can change very quickly in a very short length of time. And the political will is really the most important um, element that, that, that's required. So I think there's, there's three main things I'd like to talk about that I think we need in Ireland in order to progress. And the first thing is a political understanding of food sovereignty and where it comes from. The second is uh, Tal of Bio, which is the organization that I'm a member of and, and the role that I think it can play. And the third uh, is a long-term plan. And I think that's one of the things that we haven't seen from um, uh, Irish governments in terms of uh, agricultural strategies and plannings and planning. Uh, there's been no long-term plan for, for, for kind of sustaining uh, the Irish landscape and the Irish ecosystem for the future. So the first thing, food sovereignty. There's a lot of confusion about it. I'm gonna try and explain a little bit how it works, what my, inter my understanding of it. It's not a single prescribed idea. There's, no, there's not one single definition of food sovereignty. It's just about our right to define our own food and agricultural systems. So it gives us a framework for thinking about food and agriculture, uh, which is you know, relevant at a global, regional and local level um, with a perspective which is rooted, I'd say, in social justice, uh, agroecology and community. And it's important to understand where it comes from because food sovereignty emerges from this unprecedented interaction. And it's an interaction between peasant farmers in the global south and rich, richer farmers in Europe and North America who met for the first time in, uh, in mobilizations against the World Trade Organization. You've probably heard of the World Trade Organization, which has set the architecture for global trade. And you've heard about it recently with the WTO rules and the Brexit, etc. cetera. It's, it's the underlying set of rules with, by which countries trade internationally. And around the time that those, those rules were being established, there was a lot of opposition to them uh, uh, by farmers in, in, the, in the north and the south. And they came together in an organization called La Via Campesina. And they shared that kind of sense that this global trade system was threatening their way of life both in both those locations. And they began to articulate an alternative, uh, alternative to that, um, saying that we, we refuse to disappear, our, that our livelihoods, uh, we refuse to give them up. So in 1996, the World Food Summit was being held in Rome. Uh, governments were coming together. Um, um, sorry, no. Around the World Food Summit, you also have a meeting of NGOs and development organizations. Um, is my, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, and the NGOs were focusing almost entirely on um, food security. Uh, rather than and looking at the issue of access to food. The food security is a very simplistic term, which really just deals with whether or not you can have access to food in your locality. You can be food secure in a prison. Or, um, we're all food secure here because there's, there's food available in supermarkets and the government. It doesn't matter where it comes from. It doesn't matter what conditions are behind its production. It doesn't matter any of those things. And the farmers of the Via Campesina came to this NGO forum that was being held alongside the World Food Summit and basically said, we don't want, we're not going to have that discussion about food security. They tore up the agenda and said, we want to talk about food sovereignty. And food sovereignty brings a whole new set of questions. So it brings questions to do with rights, uh, control, politics, uh, democratic participation, uh, public interests against private interests. And above all, it proposes a participative process which puts uh, farmers and citizens at the center of decision-making. And it also, most importantly maybe, includes other aspects, not just about what kind of food is produced and where, but uh, who has access to it, about the environment, about social justice, about climate change, uh, international development, uh, global trade, uh, and solidarity. So it's, it's, it's really about the, the, the bigger picture. 
And some people have this understanding of food sovereignty as being about local food, and uh, and I think it's really it's about much more than that. It's about it's not just about eating locally and eating well. It's about a complete rethink of how the world produces food, uses land, and and distributes that food uh, throughout the throughout the global trade system. In 2007, the same organisations. Uh, realize that that term has been used and not, is not understood particularly well. So they, they organize a, an event in Mali called the Nileni Food Sovereignty uh, Conference. It's an international meeting. They bring 600 people there, delegates from f five different continents, um, farmers, peasants, environmental organizations, women's organizations, uh, social justice groups, and they come together to kind of enshrine the basis of, of food sovereignty, to define what it is. They, they sort of identify these six pillars. So they say it focuses on food for, for people, uh, the right to food, um, food diversity and food culture. It should value food providers, uh, their labor, their dignity. It should localize food systems when possible uh, and prioritize local over and regional production rather than export orientation, which is very relevant to here in Ireland. Um, it should put control locally. Now that means that we should all have a stake and should all have a a participative part in, in how the food system functions. It should feel that, that that's partly reflected in, in our day-to-day -day lives. It should build knowledge and skills. And that's about looking at traditional knowledge and, and the traditional capacities that are there and integrating those into modern practices, such as agroecology and regenerative agriculture and other things. Uh, and the last thing, and perhaps most importantly, if for the, the modern times, is that it works with nature. Um, so it should nurture natural processes, natural ecosystem processes rather than have that kind of conflictual, uh, and I, so I call it the, the dominant and control system model, which is kind of it, the approach of conventional agriculture. So that's, in 2007, that kind of marks down the, the basis of it, of food, what food sovereignty is. In 2011, there's a European forum um, where the European region decides to have their own discussion about food sovereignty, what it means. And in 2016, we had a meeting in, in Westport in, in Mayo, where we, put together the Food Sovereignty Proclamation, the Irish Food Sovereignty Proclamation. You can see that on foodsovereigntyireland.org. I'll put it in the chat later. So you can see, uh, so you, go and you can sign that online and sign up to a mailing list on that website. Uh, what, why is this all important? Why are we talking about these events and et cetera, et cetera? The, 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 why this is important is that this is a term which cannot be co-opted. It's a term which is uh, being repeatedly defended and defined and filled with meaning by farmers, and by citizens and by activists around the world. And so it's rooted in collective organization and collective action. Uh, and it, it reflects the power of citizens and citizen-led movements. So it's our term. And I think when we're talking about systemic change, which I think is what we'd like to talk about with our food system, the way it is now, it's an appropriate term for the times we live in, uh, when the need for that systemic change has never been clearer, it's never been more evident, I think. Uh, and when we're talking about the world we want to build, that get, it's, it's very important, the language that we use to describe it. And when we have a term like that, we can use, we can use that language. I think it's important. So the second point, Tollef Bio. Now, Tollef Bio is a new organization uh, which wants to see a transformation in agriculture and land use in Ireland. Um, we support food sovereignty. Um, it's made up of farmers, citizens, foresters, allotment users, seed savers, gardeners, anyone who wants to see a change in our food and agricultural systems is welcome in Talib Bio to join as a member. And the idea is to bring the voice of farmers and people who are working the land uh, into the debate to, to counteract the voice of industry and agribusiness. That's my dog barking in the background there. Apologies for that. I, can't, I have no control over that. I have less control over that than I do over the internet. So Talib Bio are the Irish members of La Via Campesina. When, when we say food sovereignty is the framework for moving forward and agroecology uh, and that regenerative practices can feed the world. We're limiting the impact of climate change. Uh, we can nurture biodiversity and ecosystems. We're not speaking alone or in isolation, but it's part of a movement which is many millions of people strong. Um, and we're talking about that from a point of view of people who are deeply connected to the land through their work um, and their livelihoods. So I think that's, a, that's very important. Uh, one thing that, that we can be sure of here in Ireland is that beef processing companies uh, and the big dairy transnationals uh, will be resistant to change. They, they don't want to see change here. Um, partly because they've influenced government for, for many years already and have, have kind of established a system here which works quite well for them. And they've, they've encouraged farmers to exploit their land to feed a global market, to produce commodities to feed a global market, to export into a global market. And that focus on volume for a global market has prioritized 
volume over uh, local food needs, over agrobiodiversity, over water and ecosystem health. Um, it's prioritized it over the economic sustainability of our rural areas. Uh, and it's actually prioritized it over the livelihoods of farmers themselves because farmers struggle to make a living selling into that market. So what's worse is perhaps that it's a model supported by agricultural subsidies. So public money, which is essentially going into the pockets of private industrial providers, fertilizers, feeds, machinery uh, via farmers. Um, so there's a huge amount of resources going into that, into sustaining that system. And th those are the resources that we need to sort of uh, take ownership of, of and begin to, to recognize that there are collectively, collective resources which are, are, are ours to, to, to decide how we, how we use. Um, I also think that that model is reaching its limitations. I mean, we're seeing the limitations of it in, in terms of the impact on the environment. We're seeing the limitations in terms of its impact on, uh, on livelihoods of farmers. So it's ripe for, for change. And in Talapio, we can see the potential for, for doing things differently. Um, not exploiting land, but seeing how we can improve land use. And through that improvement in land use, uh, improving our communities and societies because they're, they're completely interlinked. And um, we'll need to stand up to the defenders that are, of that model and show them that we can offer something better. And I think that's what we're trying to do uh, in Tolo View as well. And the first thing that we can maybe offer is some long-term thinking because that's uh, <laughs> been very lacking. Um, so when we're talking about future food, I suppose th there's, a, there's a couple of points. I'll just run through them. Um, and we can maybe think, we can, we'd love to talk about this in greater detail. And it's something we've discussed in, in Talib Bureau is to, is to go into these in, in kind of more detail and have more interaction and, and discussion about them. And uh, the first thing we, we would say is to stimulate and support local production. And um, that means we'd like to see like, a direct payment introduced for local producers, um, grants and finance to establish small scale horticulture in particular. Uh, we'd like to see a support for CSA projects and open source uh, distribution models. There's lots of alternative distribution models, alternative uh, distribution models and also the associated training and skills for farmers and not just for farmers, but for citizens, because citizens also need training in understanding how, uh, how food systems work and what they can do and how they can participate in them. Um, we you also need to think about how to integrate food policy into social and health policy, because one of the things that is common enough is that the people who can afford to eat good food, eat good food. Uh, we want to see, we don't want to see that, we want to see good food for everybody. Um, and affordability shouldn't be a barrier. Um, and we want to see accessibility to the healthiest quality, best produced food for all citizens. The second one is kind of linked to that, an, an agrochemical free island. I think that's uh, talking about phasing out agrochemical use. Uh, I would see one of the ways of doing that is by shifting the burden of proof from uh, people who are organic certified to the conventional system. That means you license uh, all inputs, uh, artificial chemical inputs, um, and you make people uh, you have a transparent system where people have to demonstrate what they're applying and how much, etc. Uh, that would certainly help the organic markets even further because if people could see what they were eating. Uh, you could also look at the potential of small scale growth in, 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 the, in the development of inputs for the organic sector. Um, we've talked about using a, uh, getting a basic income paid to all uh, full time farmers. Uh, that's, all, that's just about removing the burden of having to Gen constantly generate as much money as possible from the area that you have. Uh, there's always been a, a push, people push the land harder maybe than they, they should in times because they're, they're trying to make as much money as they can. And if you took that financial incentive away, it would help. That's linked to farming for nature, which I'll mention a little bit later. Access to land for new farmers is another issue. Um, if farming, farmland is currently locked up within the farming families that, have, that already have it. So it's very difficult if you're starting off, if you want to become a farmer out of the blue, to get access to land. The government needs to put in place schemes to, uh, to make land accessible to people who don't have, have it traditionally. Um, and also look at how they can make public land in urban and peri-urban areas available to, uh, to, to new entrants. That could also be part of a scheme where you, um, I mean, all, all cities and towns look at the hinterland that they have and the potential for food production capacities there. They can um, then develop that and look at, uh, look at establishing new farms in their hinterland areas. Um, yeah, a new forestry policy for biodiversity, not for profit. Um, I mean, Quilcher normally are now basically uh, farming the, the, the land extremely intensively in a monoculture uh, as that's what is, they're mandated to do through the Forestry Act. We would like to see that uh, Forestry Act either repealed or, 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 or a new Forestry Act put in place, which would prioritize uh, other models of forestry, native woodlands, uh, coppice, silviculture, et cetera, and integrating 
forests and farms together and not seeing them as two separate things. Um, we need to start looking at that. That would also mean uh, investing in the long-term processing of indigenous hardwoods. Um, I would put in there as well hemp production, which is uh, an absolutely no, no brainer in terms of uh, the potential that it can have. Um, and there should be supports again put in place for that, make it easier for farmers to to find markets for the hemp that they may produce uh, and, and, and processing and facilities, etc. Um, I would say farm diversification is another thing we've talked about a lot. Uh, rewarding good practice, that's like the farming for nature model, which is a very good model we have in Ireland. Um, and diversify production on farms, so integrate fruit, fruit nut, vegetable production into existing farms. Um, and like look at how we can ensure that there's markets there for that production when it does come online. A lot of those are long-term uh, investments. I mean, you may not get a return on your nut crop or your fruit crop for many years. So we have to look at how to um, how to ensure that there's a market there and that that can be processed again when it when it does come to fr to fruition. Uh, and I suppose the last uh, thing I would say, maybe just in general, is to think about how we can bring Ireland back within the carrying capacity of the island itself. So. Just we have to always remember that the iron can produce so much for for export, as well thanks to the fact that we are importing a huge amount of feeds from overseas, that we're importing fertilizers and artificial, uh, uh, you know, fertilizers for 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 our land to push the the, the land harder. So you, really, what we're looking at is how we can find a balance and produce more feed here, uh, and perhaps produce things like seeds for green manures here, uh, and so on. Uh, as well, we can talk about green energy and community ge energy generation. I think farms have a huge role to play in energy generation and, and community-led and managed uh, uh, small-scale generation of, of electricity. Essentially, what we need is a completely new food web rather to, to, to replace this food chain. And I, I think that's uh, the, the system we'll be talking about is much more diversified, much more small-scale, much more dispersed and decentralized than the current system. Um, I'm going to leave it there because I've probably talked for too long already. I have no idea how long I've been talking for. I just say maybe to finish up, the, I think it, it, it's taken a virus, this COVID virus, uh, to demonstrate maybe how sick our society actually is. So it's, it's, a, it's a real opportunity that we're coming to it now. In this emergence, or whatever it might be, there's a, there's a point where we, we're going to have to really struggle to try and uh, change the direction of the, the boat that we're on. Because at the moment... Uh, it, a, lot of, a lot of it is going the wrong way and I, I, th I think uh, if we're not active at this point in time um, it's, it's, we, we, we really risk losing out so go to tollofbio.ie um, www.tollofbio.ie join up as a member uh, and join the struggle to, to try and change our food systems for the better Via Campesina have a saying which is globalised struggle, globalised hope and I think that's uh, important because hope is something we all need um, and the feeling of solidarity that we have with many other people around the world who are trying to do the same can give us strength to move forward. So that's all I've got to say. And I'm here for your questions. So uh, I wish you well. Uh, that's great, Fergal. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. And we have had a bunch of questions um, coming in and lots of discussion, discussion happening in the, the chat box as well. Um, we don't have a huge amount of time, um, unfortunately. So I'm just going to go with the top two questions that people have voted for and yeah. apologies but if you could keep your uh, answers relatively brief, brief just so that we don't kind of go over time um, at the end if that's okay. Uh, so the first question, I'm not sure if you can see it, I'll just call it out in case, is um, how do you propose that we could introduce and educate current farmers to move towards regenerative biodiverse methods? Uh, which I think is a, a great question, I can see why I got so many, so many upvotes there. Yeah, it's not straightforward, and I think it takes time. It's, uh, I mean, that's why I said a long-term plan. We need a 50-year plan. I mean, I've been trying to convince my neighbor for nearly 10 years to, uh, to adopt some of those regenerative biodiverse methods, and with moderate degrees of success. Not much success, though, to be quite honest, and uh, he would be a lot more open-minded than many. So... Uh, I think we just have to, be, we have to firstly recognize that many farmers want to do the right thing and that they've been led down a kind of a path by Chagask and by government policy for many years, which has made them focus on this idea that you have to produce as much as you can on every square inch of grass that you have at the expense of all else. And there's nothing you can do about the price you receive for your products, 
and there's nothing else you can do about where your, where your produce ends up. And that's quite a disempowering position to be in. So, um, I mean, the most, the most, maybe the most best example we have of, 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 a, of, a, of a system which has worked to do that uh, biodiverse uh, and regenerative practices to introduce them to farmers has been examples like Burn, the Burn Life Project or the Bride Project, um, which is rewarding farmers for good environmental practice. And if that's what it takes, I mean, I think that's what, that's what we should be doing. I mean, I would, if farmers need to change their, their conception of what their job is a little bit um, to moving away from, I just have to produce as much as I can in this area that I have to, I need to maximize the spaces that there are on my farm for biodiversity. Uh, I have to look at water quality. That's my job. My job is to, is to maintain the ecosystems and landscapes. It's totally doable. It would require a huge amount of resources pushed into it. But I mean, it's a question of resources. It's not a question of, I think, will in terms of farmers. And people say farmers are stupid all the time. I totally disagree with them. And I think that farming is, is a very particular profession, which you cannot really understand unless you're, you're involved in it directly yourself. So that's why we sort of see Tala Bio as being an important voice because we're trying to um, bring the voices of farmers who, who, who are, have that direct link to the land and their profession, their livelihood um, uh, to the table. I don't know if that answered the question or not. No, I think that's, that's great, Virgo. Um, and like, I appreciate your honesty as well in you know, acknowledging that it, it can take a long time sometimes and that there, there are struggles and I think it's good to be- It could take time, but it could, it could happen very quickly as well. If we, like I said, if the resources were poured into that, I mean, yeah. it would be, it could, we could make a lot of progress in a very short period of time. Um, there's one question, just uh, and we'll move on then because we are a little bit over time already. Um, but a lot of people are still voting for it, so um, I think you've kind of answered it a little bit already. But um, the IFA, just that there is a lot of uh, farmers who are angry and frustrated with the IFA, and can Telepio be an option for them? And then yeah, that's the that question too. is: is there is it like a union in that respect? Yes, yeah, the answer is yes. It, 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 it is like a union in that respect. Um, we've opened it to citizens as well because we recognize that there's a lot of people uh, who have a lot of, who have interest and who have a stake, I suppose, in terms of the food that they eat and uh, the land, uh, the quality, water quality, etc. So it's open to citizens as well. But we really do want it to be a place where farmers feel that they can go uh, and have their interests represented. I mean, we've put a series of, of values and principles along by which we would hope uh, members would, would adhere to. Um, so in, in that sense, I suppose the, the IFA, the IFA is its own long history and we could probably have a whole call talking about the IFA here, which would be quite interesting in itself. But I mean, it's been quite a successful organization in some respects. It's also been a very destructive organization in some respects, uh, and it has a lot of internal contradictions. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I would like to see Talop Bio being a, an, an organization like that where all farmers feel that they can be represented and feel that they can be part of and that their, their voice will be heard through that organization. That's, that's certainly what we'd hope. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Virgil. Um, there is a lot of other questions and it's just unfortunately because of time, we, we won't get to all of them, but some of them um, are ones that we might be able to come back to. I see a lot of questions about CSA and stuff, which um, Sinead would be uh, very experienced in. So we will try and get back to, um, to some of them. But for now, well, yeah. I was like, did you want to I can answer, I can probably answer some of those over the, uh, in the... You can type world. in. Um, yeah, yeah, that's great, yeah. Fergal, if you can do that. Um, so just keep an eye. If anyone's written in messages, just have a look in the, the Q&A box and, and Fergal will do some of them by text. Um, and then we'll lose Fergal for a few minutes when he rejoins us um, on his phone, hopefully. So, um, yeah. But for now, um, we're going to move on to uh, Wayne Frankham from Seed Savers. Um, and Wayne, you're going to tell us about the, the work that you're doing with Seed Savers and the Gaia Foundation. Okay, good evening, everybody there. And thanks, Fergal. That was brilliant. Um, I want to start from a conversation that I had with Trina just there uh, a week ago um, when we we're looking at different people who might be on an allotment and people who have perfectly good intentions and awful, often an awful lot of knowledge about the actual produce that they have but haven't necessarily considered the seed that they're using. And this has obviously come up recently with an issue of availability. And within that, people have said, well, where do you get your seed from? Well, I get it from the supermarket. I get it from Poundland. That's cool. It's still seed. It will still grow. But where has it actually come from? We don't know the conditions it's been produced under. 
And right now, we certainly have a problem with availability. So this is a mad time within a mad time. This is a mad time already because so many people are already detached from our core needs and culture, that food culture as well. But right here, a lot of people do love their food, inside out. Most kids in the schools that I work with can name potatoes by name. And they're not just talking about mash, roast or chips, but they're talking about roosters, queens, curs, pinks. There is a connection. Last week, there was an excellent uh, webinar, and that was with Dan Barber from Row 7 Seeds in the States. They really focus on creating new gourmet varieties of seeds excellent work and it's a really close connection with plant breeders and chefs. He was talking with Debal Dev from Vraiai. Vraiai is uh, an organization, it's a folk seed bank in eastern India, They're the biggest of its type. They have 1440 varieties of rice. This is in a country that has 6,000 at the moment. But just about 40 years ago, there was over 100,000 varieties of rice. This is like a real immediate reflection of the amount of loss that we're seeing. Some have said that we've lost maybe 90% of the varieties of uh, crops that we previously grew just 100 years ago. So this is perhaps a matter of urgency. Debel went on to talk about issues that he has had there, that everyone has had there in India. These are issues that a lot of us are unfortunately aware of, such as access again to seed. The green revolution that Fergal talked about earlier in the post-war situation, this saw so many people move towards chemical use, chemical dependence, towards hybrids being used and ultimately to GM crops, genetically modified crops. Now, what has this led to in India? the most tragic situation of thousands of farmer suicides because we can't continue the traditional rights of saving seeds. That's a very simplified thing. It's much more complex than that, but it is a diabolical situation that they have right there. Debel was speaking and saying how he has varieties, a number of varieties of traditional seeds that are completely outperforming the hybrids and GMs. There is propaganda to say that this is the foods that we need to feed the world, that can address issues of drought, that can give us the higher yields. There are plenty enough traditional varieties out there to address those needs, but we need to be connected with them. We can see that here with the varieties that we have. We have lost a huge amount of connection with the varieties and what they can really give us their full nutritional capacities and abilities to deal with all manner of different environments. So I work with the Seed Sovereignty program. Seed Sovereignty is focusing on access to seed for organic and agroecological systems in particular. That's the right for growers to use to reproduce and exchange that seed, whether it is simple farmer to farmer exchange or even selling that seed and extending the right of a user to access the seed and know where it's produced, the conditions it is produced under. When you buy your organic seed, you don't necessarily know where it's, been, where it's come from. You know the company you've bought it from, but we don't understand the provenance of that. It may have been imported from anywhere under any conditions, unless you have that connection with the producers. Your supplier should be able to tell you that. We have that option in Ireland because we have a handful of seed producers, just the same as they do in the UK. But that, how small is that? We have a 90% dependence on imported seed. So the Gaia Foundation came from a foundation of working with the Global South, particularly supporting communities moving from uh, extractivism. Also working with seed issues throughout Africa, South America, India. Then looking back to Europe and saying, well, hang on, we have a situation here. As I say, 90% dependence on seed imports. They had a fantastic um, exhibition recently of We Feed the World. That was reflecting 
the fact that we have less than 90, 90 less than 30 percent of the cultivated land on this planet producing more than 70 percent of the world's food again this is a essential response to the lie that there isn't the land there okay there isn't the land for the massive expansion of an industrial model which is perhaps just producing livestock feed it's a madness it's a poor reflection of our actual capacities we are able to feed ourselves with the soils we have with the relationship we have with the soils we have the seed sovereignty movement looked to ireland and the uk as it stands we're looking at the end of phase one of the program and we're just reaching out to phase two so that was 30 months that we were engaged here in ireland um, and we're looking at another three years now there has been a connection with across the uk with grain groups with the land workers association who are in in turn connected with Livia campesina as Fogel mentioned there that's the particular actions that you're finding in the uk here in Ireland, we've been partnered with Irish Seed Savers, thank you very much, um, where they have been established for nearly 30 years. It'll be their anniversary next year. They have uh, orchard with 170 different varieties. Um, nearly 80 of those would be native Irish apples. It's a 20 acre farm that under usual circumstances, you'll be welcome to visit. Seed gardens, a dedicated seed bank, they offer training there. As I say, we have only a small amount of seed being produced here. With a 20 acre farm, you're not going to feed all, provide all of the seed for the country, but we can extend that product, production through seed guardians. Those seed guardians are, pro, are trained through a seed to seed program, which is ongoing. As part of the program we we had a great event last year called the living seed that was held in the clock jordan eco village um, we had representatives from the various producers in ireland which includes uh, irish seed savers brown envelope seeds the herb garden um, eco seeds and true harvest seed next year we would hope to also bring on sandro from wildflowers as well um, that included tours of seed savers as well as the clock jordan farm so clock jordan farm like a csa it's more of a community farm uh, producing for the people who live there brilliant example of what you can do when you are saving your own seed because that's what they do they produce so much of their own they go through a process of improving the seed that they have so this is something that, again anybody can do once you begin with the act of seed saving seed so they can produce it they can improve it and so they're producing more than 70,000 onions a year. That's a cost saving. But you're also in total control of that seed. This is the sort of connections that we need again. We, we really need to understand how everything tastes, how it performs, and have that ability to pass that seed on. Another feature of the event were, was uh, Hannes Slorenzen, um, who explained about the EU regulations and a proposed change that is going to be happening as of January next year. That's where we're going to see a review of heterogeneous material. So that's what our organic and open pollinated seeds are, the ones that are open to change in the environment, not restricted, but there are issues with that seed at this point because we are restricted by things like dus which is a measure of distinctness uniformity and stability so seeds have to comply with this in order to be registered by the eu and for us to be able to sell this change is going to enable more organic producers and others who have amateur varieties that have been used as heritage seed through the generations but are a bit more variable. We all know about our wonky veg. This is a route towards being able to utilize all of these things that have actually been valued for many generations. So right now we have issues. 
Anybody out there who's a grower will have noticed you've had tiny little windows because everybody's supposedly running out of seed. It's not the case. What has happened is that there has been an enormous surge of demand for all of the seed suppliers, over 200%. So maybe you've only seen an hour window in a week to buy your seed. It's not because it's run out, it's just because they've got to process those orders when you're exercising restricted social distancing and obviously a number of staff who cannot even attend for other reasons. So what do we need to do now? As a whole, I'm not advocating that everybody goes out and saves seed because it needs to be done with a conscious mind towards quality. So if everybody just lets everything go to seed, that's not cool. <laughs> we come to a seed swap and you get given something that is bolted, that is crossed with several other things, you find out it's rubbish and you don't go back to a seed swap. We need to be aware of some of the essential processes. We need to go through basic training. The Seed Sovereignty Programme has really helped growers, commercial growers, as well as community growers, to engage with training, to understand these traditional skills, skills that have been passed down through 10,000 years of agriculture that we've letting slip away. What can we do now? Well, you can engage with training. There is uh, it's a training you can find through Seed Savers. You can find it through NOTS, which is the National Organic Training Scheme. And we do tailor-made training for communities as well. It basically means that everything is in the hands of fully integrated communities. Don't worry about the political action and everything else. Yes, it has a place to play, but a community is made of farmers, of gardeners, of schools, of consumers. It's about these people coming together and actually saying, well, no, we can do this. And we can, with our training, each person saving a couple of varieties, we redevelop our culture. We supply to each other, we develop networks, we develop hubs where we can share our materials, our seed, and have a future of abundance because the seeds are there from the plants that just want to produce. I have a list of organisations, including Irish Seed Savers and the Seed Sovereignty website, where you can get lots of links to other resources. You'll find that from the end, from the organisers at the end of this. Um, I will welcome your questions and be mindful of the time. Uh, thanks, Wayne. Um... I don't have to give you the time reminders though, which is good. Um, so appreciate that. Um, and yeah, thank you. It's great to kind of hear how people can get involved themselves and, and where we can go from this, that, you know, seed saving, even for myself, I thought it was something that sh that's for seed savers to do. Um, so it's great to know that there's lots of trainings out there and opportunities for, for all of us across the country to, to get more involved. Um, we've got a lot of questions and, there was one or two that were voted up to the top. Um, I think this is quite an interesting question, even for people who maybe are experienced growers in their homes. Um, is there a way to check on seed packets where they are from? Um, it's so difficult to know, especially at the moment um, where it's, it's kind of hard to be choosy. So what's the best way of knowing exactly where your seeds are coming from? Okay, so this has been an issue that there is no requirement for provenance on your seed packet. And a lot of suppliers will simply say, well, why should there be? I mean, at the end of the day, we are telling you that it is of a certain standard. It meets organic criteria, so that's fine. But what you should be able to do, and you can do with the likes of um, the seed co-op in the UK, they will tell you each of the actual farmers that are producing the seed for them, as well as the seed they're producing themselves. The list that, I've, that, you, that is available to you, all of those people are producers themselves. They won't just tell you which country they've come from, they'll tell you which field they've come from and probably which plot they've actually come from. So it's about going to your local producer, which is the ones that really need to be supported. So in, in Ireland, as far as organics go, Irish seed savers, brown envelope seeds, and the herb garden. Uh, when it comes to your wildflowers, you've also got wildflowers.ie, 
you've got eco seeds and true harvest seeds also extending into the other uh, native flora of this country and then in the uk the seed co-op real seeds and vital seeds as i say all of that is going to be available from an email afterwards um yeah great so okay, yeah. i'm also open to uh, emails as well so. oh thanks Wayne. um we can share the contact information and we will um give all of the links and everything that wayne has mentioned will be sent out an email afterwards like you said um there's another question here that's got a lot of votes is how can communities access public land for community gardens and i know there was another question further down that was kind of similar um asking about access to allotments and and is there any push to have that happen more um that it was that is something that's seeing happening in the UK um, and is there any push for that to happen in Ireland and I know myself um, in Dublin we've seen a lot of community gardens close in the last couple of years some of them to be replaced with things like car parks um, so I don't know if you do you have much information about how people can kind of access that land I mean really we would like to see more of it and we have uh signposting opportunities from the likes of the Seed Sovereignty website. So when people are aware of um, such opportunities, if those are shared, then that's a way of people to connect. But we're not actually seeing the specific action. Now, maybe Tolibio is, is a, in more of a position to tell us about any specific actions. Other than that, it's really about connecting with your local community. I would know here, there's certainly one local farmer. He has a great uh, Mehul site where they have uh, local communities working together it really comes down to individual action and why shouldn't it but we need to be engaged as communities yeah absolutely and um, just to mention as well if you you know if this is something that people are interested in kind of working on and maybe they don't have a community of people around them already um, you know there's lots of places to to find where your local community garden is online but also um, as I mentioned at the start of the call um, we work with a group of activists on our Growing Together team and um, you know there's always energy there to to work on new projects that are that are needed so um, I would say get in touch with me as well if you're looking to kind of find an activist group to work on different issues regarding access to land and agriculture in general um, and maybe the you know we can point you in the right direction or it's something we can work on together. Um, so I can just see Fergal has rejoined us um, through his phone and uh, is going to give us a little bit of a, a tour and thankfully we still have some daylight so Fergal I don't know if you can hear me I'm just gonna... uh, yeah I can hear you now yeah can you hear me yes we can hear you so um, okay. just to let people know as well this is also just an opportunity to give a bit of a break it is quite a long webinar so um, it uh, I really want to see what Fergal's going to show us but also if you need to go to the bathroom or get a glass of water or anything this might be a good time um, before Sinead starts her part Okay, thanks, Virgil. Okay, I'll try and be pretty. This will just be the quickest tour I've ever done as a farm, but I'll, I'll, so basically, we so there were two fields. They were both um, just grassland. Uh, there was this field here, uh, and there was the other one, which I'll bring you down to. Um, we use a system of green manure. So a lot of these have just been converted from green manure. You can kind of see over there uh, where I've just shredded up some of the green manure. Green manure is a crop that we grow over the over the winter just to that's all going to be mixed in to the um, to the to the soil. We have that. Will be all pumpkins there. This is the some of the kale from last year, which I let go to flower. Uh, we had some purple sprouting broccoli there, and there's, there's some garlic coming. And up here we have the winter. This is kind of the winter. We do pumpkins in the winter brassicas up here. Um, so most of nearly everything we supply goes into a high-end restaurant in Galway called Lum. We've sold to markets, we've done community sports agriculture, we've done this voluntary box schemes, and it, what worked out the easiest was actually selling to this, um, was selling to this restaurant, because it takes nearly everything we, 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 we produce, the processes is a lot of stuff, um, and yeah, it's just an easier relationship for us, to be quite honest, and really that's what half of the battle is, is just making sure that you can sell the things that you produce and try and make a livelihood for yourself, that's the challenge. Uh, these are just uh, apple trees here. You can see I've got comfrey in between the apple trees. That's working really well. Um, it keeps the grass down and the bees love it and come in here and create a lot of flowers to pollinate the way. We also have enough apples to make cider, which is good, and apple juice as well for ourselves. So um, uh, we sell them as well to the restaurant. We used to sell them to the box 
stuck to the three CS face game as well. So that's that through there. I'll just uh, jog down here. It's my dog. Um, this is the other field. So again, this is this is we just call this meadow. This was just a a big grassy field with these cut hay, um, and it really has been trying to return to grass since we moved in. Um, so it's it's just a bit of a challenge. It's quite shallow soil, very free draining, um, quite poor, and there's a lot of organic matter. Well, not as much organic, there's a lot of manuring. Um, but in here we've got you know, these are all soft fruits. So there's raspberries. Uh, there's more apple trees, we've got plums here, there's blackcurrants, another fruits down there. Um, they're quite labor intensive, but they're, they're actually you can charge quite a good price for them as well. So we're, so, we're sort of organic, uh, we're in the second year now, so we're nearly, nearly completely ready to be organic. We've been in uh, what's it called conversion for two years. Uh, so this is the first tunnel, so you can see where I was sitting at the end of that tunnel there. Um, there's a lot of new potatoes in here. Uh, and then there's a lot of stuff that we would have grown for that restaurant, for example, and this is an unusual little thing. Uh, it's called Okahajiki. Uh, well, actually, it's called Salsola, I think it's the Italian one, but very nice. Uh, very salty. Delicious. Uh, we don't really know where we're going to sell that stuff now because the restaurants are closed, so new potatoes should be no problem. Just going to ask you that, Gregor, actually. Um, Sorry? I was just going to ask you that actually because um, you mentioned that your set your food is mostly for um, loam in Galway. Um, restaurant. And now that they're closed, yeah, yeah, for the restaurant. Now that they're closed, do you have an alternative plan, or is this something that you're well, still working on? Yeah, we're, we're talking about going back to the CSA, um, or at least going back to a box. Or, I mean, I'll be honest, the demand is out there, so it shouldn't be difficult. I don't think people are really interested. Um, it's just it's just a little bit more hassle. It's more work for us. That was always the issue, really. Um, the beauty of with the restaurant was we could just harvested whatever was ready and brought it, and he would deal with it. Um, it's just a little bit more work if you have to go to market or if you have to organise in the CSA. But um, yeah, we're, we're talking about that at the moment. I think we might go back to doing the CSA. It also the only other issue, little issue we had, I suppose, is that we have a lot of perennials and things like that, and I like odd ball things like that, that sort of, which I just showed you, which aren't the kind of thing you would put in a, in a box, uh, not the kind of thing people are really interested in. So we've had to reorganize our planting plan and stuff like that a little bit, but it's, I think we'll be okay. I mean, look, there's worse, it's, you know, we'll see, I think we'll be okay. Yeah. And that's the, the other tunnels. We've got a lot of tomatoes down. I mean, it's it happened actually at a time of year, which could be, it, could, it would be a lot worse if it happened later in the year, you know, I think. This time of year, we're kind of in transition anyway from overwintering crops and tunnels to, um, to like, you know, to, to a lot of, we're transplanting a lot of stuff out. So, like, if this is happening in, in September or August, even uh, we have an awful lot more. This is the outdoor area. We'd be transplanting stuff in here at the moment. I mean, we've got cabbages and broccoli in there. Um, we, we saw a lot of green manure. So, even in between, some of these beds might be green manure. And the idea there is just to attract beneficial insects and um, break up the not the veg and lettuce and there's some, uh, some that was a row beach that went in today so we all the beds are 30 meters long uh, we do all the work with the, I've got a small tractor um, and some machinery for that these onions in here and um, let's come back up somebody has asked so, how many yeah. people you have working on your farm Fergal uh, this is myself and my partner so two now we would normally uh, organize mehos around this time of year um, particularly when there's big jobs, like we need to spread manure or do a big weeding job. Um, but actually, no, it's just the two of us, uh, you know, for most of that. So, yeah, it's, been, it's a lot of work, but I mean, it's a busy time of year as well, because we just so we, we spend our time doing so. I mean, I, I think ideally you'd have more, uh, I'd love to have more people helping. And like, I mean, certainly over the summer when we do the harvest, we bring more people we try and get more people in. I sometimes get the local teenagers in to pick berries and things like that, like, you know, and give them a few quid. Um, but I'd rather have a system, yeah, where we had a bit of more labor support and it's something we need to resolve ourselves. I'll just show you some of the, uh, some of these tools. Um, there's some interesting tools here. This is a, like a ridger. This is like, it's like a ridger, a uh, hand ridger. We use that for ridging the spuds. This tool is called the farmer's friend. Uh, it's just for making the lines. The production and uh, there's some different various hoes. There's a wheel hoe here. Um, we also keep bees. You can see there's some honey in that box. 
That's, that's a wheel hoe. That, that, we use that for weeding once the crops are in. Uh, I'm not gonna, I can't really demonstrate it now. Uh, these are the kind of things we might make up if we, I mean, like as I mentioned earlier to the others, that it's hard to find appropriate tools. So sometimes you can just make it yourself. So they're just for spacers, plant spacing, when we're trying to space out what we're going to transplant. Uh, yeah, I suppose that's about it. Really, not much else. Uh, that's great. Plants. Thanks, Virgo. It's, it's just lovely to, to actually see kind of what you're doing practically. Um, uh, especially, you know, as someone who you were working in Brussels for a long time. So it's good to see that um, it is possible for people to return I think, to that. I think anybody can, can can throw their hand if they have the, if you have, if you love it enough. That's what my neighbor said to me when uh, I moved back here. He's like, oh, you have to love it. You have to love it. And he's right. You, you do have to love it. So, but if you do, then um, it's totally doable. I mean, eight years we've been here and you can achieve a lot in a short length of time if you really put your mind to it. So I would encourage anyone who has any kind of graph or, doing a bit in the land to just go and throw themselves into it, you know, that's uh, what I would recommend. That's brilliant. Thanks so much, Fergal. Um, no bother. Great. Um, I, I really, I really enjoy seeing the farm. Um, there was just one quick question, just uh, someone had asked how big uh, your farm is, how much space you have there. Um, okay, so the, the two fields that we were just in are five acres in total. So we have land around that now. My, um, it's, 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 this is my family's uh, land that we're on. So there's another 20 acres, but that's it's mostly woodland and it's boggy land and kind of mix of stuff. Um, so the two fields that we can kind of use for producing are the uh, five acres in total. So I mean, yeah, what you saw there basically uh, five acres. It's brilliant. Um, it's great. It's yourself and, and I know Sinead um, as well. It's uh, very inspiring for people like me who are city dwellers oh, yeah. at the moment to know that it is possible. So uh, we'll make the farm out of you yet, Tria. We'll, we'll make it. We'll get, we'll get. Well, Sinead has been working on me for quite a while now. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, speaking of Sinead, um, we're going to move on and Sinead is going to, like I said, Sinead is a member of Talapio as well. But um, Today she's going to be talking to us about um, her experiences uh, with her micro dairy mail and also um, as a co-founder of Future. And I know there's been a lot of questions coming in about um, CSA, which means Community Supported Agriculture. What is it? Uh, how does it work? Um, and things like that. So that might be something that comes up um, with uh, Sinead when you're talking. But if it isn't, then we might just throw a few questions at you at the end, Sinead, if you don't mind. Uh, okay, so I'm going to try and uh, share uh, a PowerPoint slide here, so bear with me. Uh, okay, can everyone see that? I assume so. Okay, so um, let me switch this to the slide. So I'm here to talk about uh, future and food citizenship and I suppose bring in my own kind of experience um, as well and, and mention my own journey of, of food citizenship. So I suppose the thing to start with is what is food citizenship and here is a, a beautiful academic term. So the term food citizenship is defined as the practice of engaging in food related behaviours that support rather than threaten the development of a democratic, socially and economically just and environmentally sustainable food system. It's a big thing to get out in one sentence. We'll talk about terms like food sovereignty, feed sovereignty, food citizenship. We can kind of sometimes be a little bit overwhelmed about um, the meaning of it. So, really think of food citizenship in simple terms as a thing of eating your values. So, this is about it's a journey, it's about trying to figure out where you are in that journey. And each one of us begins this journey at a different starting point. So, probably the best way to um, to show this is give you uh, the story behind Future and how it came to be. So Natalie and I met on our masters in Galway a few years back and Natalie lives in Dublin city centre and I moved back to Mayo. So I'm privileged enough to have access to land in Mayo and my partner wanted to farm and he wanted to work with livestock and I was writing uh, a thesis on sustainable diets and how we could reduce the consumption uh, of, of livestock. So that was uh, that left many an interesting debate at our table. But in short, one of the most interesting things after we finished our, our masters is neither of us wanted to work in an office-based job and we wanted to do something that was a bit more hands-on and active. And through different networks 
uh, through Food Sovereignty Ireland and, and Natalie's involved with the CSA, we got to meet loads of different people and loads of farmers on the to what I understand farming to be in Ireland. So for me, that was a big awakening. So the most interesting thing when I moved back to Mayo was that Natalie, being in Dublin City Centre, actually had access to, to food direct from the farm and she was buying her food direct from a farmer. And for me, based in Mayo, farming myself and surrounded by farms, I was actually reliant on the supermarket because I didn't know who was around me. How was I able to access the farmer? It was not the easy thing to do. So you might want to start your food citizenship journey, but there's barriers to that journey. So because of that, we created um, a website, uh, future.ie, and we created something called a fair food map. So we believe that in simple terms, to think of ourselves as eating our values, that there's two things that you need to know. You, one, you need to know your farmer, and two, you need to know your food. So we created the Fair Food Map, and on there, we map farmers, and we tell their story. And we tell how they produce food uh, that is fair to people, place, and planet. On top of that, we also uh, use this hashtag on all our social media to know your farmer. So we want you to reconnect with who produced your food so that you can get to know how they produced it in harmony with nature. After that, we also create content. And this content is around this theme of food citizenship. So this, again, idea of eating our values and that to really know how we can create a, a better food system, a fairer food system, we need to know everything from how that food is produced. Because there's a lot of things from food, from soil issues, to, as Wayne has spoken about, seed sovereignty issues. Where does that seed come from? How it was produced? Is it open access? Is this something, am I supporting a bigger company that I don't even know about that may not necessarily have a good food justice record in different parts of the world? So we create content from podcasts to videos to written articles that is trying to help reconnect those of us that are disconnected from the agriculture world. And this it, the aim of it is to get you to from that soil to seed to plate to policy. So, hashtag know your food. So learn how to take action on your food and through your food choices that support the values you have around climate and biodiversity. And eating well and choosing food that is fair to people, place and planet. And really to make those decisions again, you need to know who's producing your food. How is that produced? And that's not necessarily possible because again, there's barriers to this. So awareness, our job really, what we're trying to do is create awareness around eating our values. So we often do workshops and we ask people to think about the last thing they ate. Where do they think that came from? How did it get to their table? Who do they think produced it? All these different questions. And again, this is to help us move from this idea of us as a consumer, as this passive individual who is who has sold things to a food citizen. And again, it's about language and, and thinking differently about ourselves and the power that we have. So action. We can all take different actions from small steps to big steps. And really this depends on where you are on your journey. There's people here that are on this I can see names <laughs> coming up and they're way beyond, the, they're so far down the journey on food citizenship, the, the, the term doesn't even mean it to them. And then there's some of us who are just beginning to start this because of COVID in some strange way, it's been a good thing for the local food movement because it, it has made us think about where our food is coming from. So moving from the supermarket to finding a local farmer, involving yourself with the CSA, which is Community Supported Agriculture, uh, local markets, Obviously, they're closed right now, but a lot of the farmers are still finding ways to, to uh, get food direct to the local community. Doing things from learning to preserve your food, so from fermenting to going further down the line for those of us who like to grow our food, as Wayne has mentioned, to learning how we eat in different scenarios. And if you don't have these things, then there's things that you can do. You can take action and get involved with groups like Talib Bio, even if you're not on the, on the land and working the land, you can get involved with these organizations that are supporting this idea of food sovereignty. And that is an action in itself that is all about food citizenship. So I'll just tell you a little bit about my journey on food citizenship. So I 
come from background. I grew up on a suckler farm in the west of Ireland. And as a teenager, my only ever role on the farm was literally to stand in a gap. So that meant when they were moving cows, I got to stand in a gap to stop them from going into it. No more, no less. I may have been able to name a cow here and there. I left, travelled, worked around in different places, and I went back to college as a mature student. And from there, as Trina has mentioned, I did natural science. And from that, I kind of focused in on food. And I really thought that the best way for me to take action through uh, on food and the environment was through policy. But actually, again, it's a journey. Food citizenship is a journey. And my journey took us on a very different path. And I now actually, with my partner, work on the land. And we run a farm and a micro dairy. And we're really, really lucky that uh, the farm we now manage was never farmed intensely. So we have really species rich grass. We have thick hedgerows, we have old farm buildings. So we decided that we had to find a way to farm that would both conserve and preserve these things on our farm and at the same time provide a sustainable livelihood for us as well as nurture as best we can our local community. So we uh, operate a small micro dairy. So we have a herd of about 12 cows that are traditional breeds and they only eat the pasture that is on our farm. And that's it. And we milk them and we sell milk locally. We also then run hens in after them because we're an organic system. So we try to find different innovative ways and old school ways to uh, reduce uh, different burdens on our farm. So we use hens as well, then they work in harmony with the cows. And the offshoot is that is that we have eggs to sell locally to the farm. So I'm one of the privileged people like Fergal, who has the ability to work the land and we can take action in that way. But for those of uh, myself being included, having lived in an urban setting for a long time, we don't necessarily have that access to land, but there's still different actions that we can take. So whether that's from jumping on to future.ie and finding a farmer that's local to you and getting in touch with them, finding about how they farm, seeing does that align with your values, even if they values and then choosing food that, that aligns with that and being active and, and thinking about the choices that we make rather than this passive consumer. Because the, again, as, as Fergal has mentioned about language, language is very powerful and how we refer to ourselves can either make us passive or active. And then, as I said, there's loads of different things you can do from you can learn to preserve your food, you can learn to eat seasonally. These things are really, really good as well. Like you can have a massive impact at a climate level to a biodiversity level by doing small things like that. But every action means something. And do remember that this is a journey. So whether it's learning to cook fresh with the seasons, again, learning to take raw ingredients and cook simple, but cook good nutritious food, to learn and to grow your own, to your salad on the balcony or gorilla gardening in the park. These are all different actions that you can take to be a food citizen. And each one of us, as I said, has started this journey at a different point. So no one is right or wrong here. As long as we're all on that same path, we will get there towards this idea of food citizenship and food sovereignty. So I think one of the best quotes, uh, it's a nice, uh, simple one. And I always find it, it's a great one. And, and if I can recommend any book to read, Wendell Berry would be one of them. But this idea that eating is an agriculture act. And Michael Pollan sums it up that he meant that we are not just passive consumers of food, but co-creations of the system that feeds us. So depending on how we spend our food dollars, we can either go to support the food industry devoted to quantity and convenience, or we can choose one of value. And then that's the question. What is the value? And discovering your food values and eating your values is the start of your food citizenship journey. And that's it. That's great, Sinead. Um, thanks, Emil. Do you want to stop sharing your screen just so that we can see your lovely face in full? Um, if you could, thank you. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's really good that you've drawn attention to the fact that there are so many different things that we can do as citizens. Um, and I just saw actually a few minutes ago, um, Joanne Butler is on the call. Um, Joanne is from Our Organic Gardens in uh, Donegal and she is running a Grow Your Own course starting next week. Um, yep. And there's also loads of other things that you can uh, get involved with even if you're not on the land. So uh, thanks for kind of pointing out all those different things. 
Um, again, we have a bunch of questions. Um, the one that is coming up as the top one for the last little while, um, it says for all panelists, um, but I'll give it to yourself and then if anyone else wants to jump in afterwards, that's fine as well. Um, so what is the status of regenerative agriculture in Ireland? And are you, it says, um, are you in a position to help it on given its potential for reversing climate change? A big question. <laughs> um, I don't necessarily think it's Future's position to, uh, I think each one of us has a different role to play and Future is trying to kind of bridge that gap between, and I, I'll use the term because the term we all know, consumer and food producer, and we do that through content. Um, but we can definitely help share the message of regenerative agriculture. So a lot of the farmers that we have in there, including my own farm, and um, we do practice different things of, uh, you know, methods of regenerative agriculture. And we kind of have had a podcast that has spoken about regenerative agriculture. And, you know, what is it? Because, again, it's a term that is thrown around and not all of us necessarily know what that means. So even those of us within the farming community. So we try and, as I said, create content that is trying to um, reconnect people to food and farming. And I suppose that's our role. But Talib Bio definitely has a role to play, um, along with other organisations as well. I think if there's anything to learn about the future of, uh, of food, it's this idea of collaboration over competition. You know, that's the way we really have to go forward. And there's enough of um, active networks out there in Ireland who can work together to really uh, drive, whether it's regenerative agriculture, organic farming, all of these things that definitely um, are about farming with nature. Uh, great. Thanks so much, Nate. Um, we are running out of time a little bit, so I'm going to ask a question that's probably uh, not too long of an answer. Um, and I, I know from uh, from following uh, the social media of your farm uh, that you are um, all about animal welfare. And if anybody, wants, <laughs> if anyone wants some very nice cow content, then definitely go and check out farm um, Sinead's farm Glambui on on Instagram. It's uh, my daily uh, treat. Um, <laughs> So does Future cover transparency around animal welfare? Yeah, so it's a big, big one, uh, animal welfare. And again, it depends. Like you speak to any conventional uh, farmer or anyone that does, say, farm inspections. And Ireland has a good welfare standard, but it depends on how those standards are. Uh, and again, so that depends on your idea, my idea of what those standards should be as well. So at Future, what we do is we ask the farmer to tell us um, exactly how they farm. So we, you know, we in general support organic and regenerative farmers. And we kind of know all of the farms that are on there as well, which is why it's not overly populated, because we do our best to get to know them, because transparency is key. We can't talk about helping people to reconnect if we don't know the farms ourselves. So yes, it would be a big concern. And we have, so every farm that is on the website has to fill out a form. And they have to be clear and transparent with us in everything they do from soil health to to animal welfare in regards to antibiotic use or organic farming or anything. That's brilliant. Thanks. Uh, thanks for clarifying, Sinead. Um, I'm going to just do a couple of questions that just are getting a lot of votes. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a few questions just to any of the panelists um, who might want to answer. So it doesn't necessarily have to be yourself, Sinead. Um, so the one that kind of most people are, are voting for here is um, how do you recommend bringing organizations like Chagisk on board um, who have a huge influence over farming innovation in Ireland? And I think that's one that probably most people would, would be curious about. So um, I don't know which one of you might want to answer. Fergal, <laughs> um, still there? Fergal, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, Chagask is a semi-state body, so uh, I mean, it's a it's a politics question essentially. I mean, I, I, it's, they're semi-independent, but at the same time, I think that they they very much toe the line with what they they do what they're told. So, like, I mean, we, we we have the farming system we have not because of some just chance. We we have the farming models that exist on the fields in front of us because of political decisions that have been made over over many years. So that's just it, none of this happens in a vacuum. I mean, you tell Chagas to stop uh, researching industrial production systems and start researching agroecology and you pour millions and millions of euros into that and you say, we want Ireland to be a market leader, a world leader in agroecological regenerative farming in 10 years time. 
and it happens. It'll happen. So, like, I mean, there's a culture in those organizations which is also built up over maybe 20 or 30 years, um, and there's the same culture that exists in the IFA, and it's the same culture which is, uh, you know, exists in some of the beef processing, you know, and it's the culture that we just have to challenge uh, through political decisions and they're not going to be easy decisions but that's why i think we need a strong citizen-led movement a farmer-led movement which can uh build the the the, the strength of, of of public support and put that behind what we want to see happen i mean we're talking about building a social movement like i i think we need a kind of movement here like we had for the water charters uh, for, for for something like that where you build a kind of mass movement where people say enough is enough let's reorientate this completely let's reorganize things completely and i think we need to start looking at how we can build that kind of movement yeah i would agree with fergal um it is about again it, it comes back to values like it is the kind of our current agricultural system is based purely on production for production's sake and we're export driven which is not necessarily the way we want to be but it's the it's the values that we have around food and around farming i think that has to change and until that that swell from the ground comes yeah we can you know we can force political action we can demand political action but it's going to take a movement from the ground that shows that actually our values around food and farming are different and we want to farm a farming system and a food system that supports farmers that support um, a better environment and that actually produces nourishing food you know like you all you just have to look at global statistics of where we are in regards to our diet and we can definitely feed the world but we don't know how to nourish the world anymore so that's that's the value you know we have to decide on where we want to put our money Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna do one more question and then if any of you have any final comments, um, then you're more than welcome. Um, it's quite a long question, <laughs> so uh, bear with me. So um, Ellen has said, so inspired by the work of Food Tree, Talapio and Seed Savers, thank you. Um, I wonder how we can ensure the people who have migrated here to live and migrants who often do really difficult work in the food system can be included in the changes that we need to make and be part of creating a fair future based on agroecology and food sovereignty. A lot of people don't have choice around what they eat in Ireland, um, where we have food injustice on so many levels. Um, it goes on, but I think um, I think that's enough for you for you to answer the the question. Um, I'm not sure which one of you might want to take that one. I'll go briefly, just because it's something that I, I feel strongly about. I, th I, mean, I think the direct provision system in Ireland is, is barbaric. And I mean, what's happening in, in direct provision centres is, is a very good example of people's rights and their right to their own culturally appropriate food being removed from them. And I think that's almost a direct, I think that's an intentional uh, policy to try and dehumanise them and to try and remove their agency and sense of self-worth. So in some sense, I think it's a very good example of somewhere that... Um, that we could look to, look at building uh, food sovereignty because we, we need to build international solidarity. We need to, and we need to learn from cultures and their their production and their what what they eat and why they eat that and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. I think that diversity in what people eat is is very important. I mean, the world is narrowing everything down to some sort of global diet, which is um, which means that we concentrate on a minority of crops uh, and mass produce those. But I, I think, yeah, it's a very good point. And I, I'd love to see more work done in lots of areas around food and farming. And I think the point I was trying to make earlier about uh, integrating social justice um, into the discussion of food and agriculture, integrating more issues. So like there's more strands that we can, that we can draw together underneath this food sovereignty framework. And that's why it's such a, a, a useful framework because it, it integrates questions like that within it. So it's not just talking about how we use the land. It's talking about... Um, about people and and about how, how they have access to to food and how they how they can interact with with that and the broader societal question. So, yeah, I absolutely see a place for that discussion about migrants' rights and particularly the recreation centre within the food sovereignty movement. Uh, absolutely. Thanks, Virgil. Um, does anyone else want to add anything to that? Um, so just uh, before we move on, I might just uh, take one more final question, but um, just since we're talking about the issue of um, direct provision, and I totally agree with Fergo that it's completely barbaric. Um, and Sian, I know you're only here in a tech support role, um, but I know that you're involved with organisations that do a lot of support for, um, 
for people living in direct provision. So I don't know if there's any organizations you'd like to direct people to that maybe they can support um, themselves. I know Cooking for Freedom are doing a lot of work to try and get people access to appropriate food for Ramadan. Is there um, anything else that people can kind of support? And look into? Yes, I'd recommend having a look at the movement of asylum seekers social media, so Massey on Facebook and on Twitter, and then also Refugee and Migrant Solidarity Ireland, um, Ramsey on Facebook and on Twitter. And we've shared some links there to a couple of those crowdfunders for Cooking for Freedom, for food for people uh, to cook their own food in direct provision, especially during COVID-19, and then also a crowdfunder um, for Muslims to access food during Ramadan, um, which is currently ongoing and is even more difficult for them under COVID. Uh, thanks, Ian. Um, I really appreciate that. And we will put all of that information in the email as well so that people can like really easily access that information. And if you are in a position to, um, to support any of the fundraisers that are going, then it's a really great thing to, to get behind for sure. Um, there's just one final question um, that it was pointed out that we haven't really covered and I think that um, it would be a shame for us to, to finish without, without having missed something out and it's just in relation to the debate about um, kind of animal agriculture and its impact on the environment um, and I don't know particularly yourself Sinead, I, thought I, typed, I thought I typed an answer to that did I, I thought I answered that question obviously yeah. Yeah, didn't. Maybe you did a written one. I have. There's so many questions I haven't seen all of the oh, written yeah, answers. Okay. So, um, if the person who asked asked that question, if you want to go back into the Q and A, there is an answered section that Fergal might have responded. Yeah, maybe to. Do you I want didn't. To just summarize what you said quickly, Fergal. I will. But I'd like to get that Sinead in there too. And I, I, I think what I was saying was more or less that point about the the trend towards a global diet and that focus on the, the increase in meat and and wheat and all those production systems. I mean, I I think one of the key. Uh, elements of agroecology is looking at the ecosystem, what it can support and looking at the climatic conditions and what they can support. And like, I mean, I think there's a place for animal agriculture in some parts of the world and there's other parts of the world where there's, there's not such a place for animal agriculture. And, that, you know, we, it's, you're trying to fit a, a square peg into a round hole sometimes when they're trying to produce, uh, you know, those of dairy in the desert in Morocco or something like that. So, you know, sometimes maybe people in Ireland could have more meat and dairy in their diet and other parts of the world have less uh, there's other things that they might eat there i mean the human beings can exist in every climatic area on the planet and have found ways of doing so in their through their local ecosystems without the need for uh wheat or other etc cetera, etc cetera. I, I don't know Sinead, i'm sure you've got lots to, to add to that it's more your you're the dairy um, man. <laughs> before you start Sinead, uh, with you chomping at the bit um i i just to say that it is half past eight now which is the time that we said that we would finish um we do have uh just like a couple of little closing things so we might go on kind of five minutes later but obviously to anyone who needs to go uh just a big thank you for for joining us and um it will be recorded it is being recorded and it will be sent out afterwards um but hopefully most of you can stay with us for an extra five minutes or so um so sorry Sinead you're, you're welcome to come in there now. Uh, no you're all right uh, I saw the question and it was, it's a very loaded question. Um, it's not as simple, like if you, wanna, if you want to work within our current food system and you want to look at idolized diets, so all research is idolized diets. We're looking at a vegan diet, a vegetarian diet, um, the average uh, modern Western diet of today. And we idolize it and we take the values of that and we come up with carbon footprints. And that's all fine and dandy, but on the ground, that's not how it is. And it, it completely ignores issues relating from food justice to food sovereignty to geography. Um, so, yeah, if we want to remain with a globalized food system, then we, you know, I can see where this value of, of no livestock ever makes sense. But that's not really how it works on the ground. And I think that's where you need to really look at stuff like agroecology, which is, you know, is again under that food sovereignty to food citizenship thing, which is all about um, reconnecting with your food on a very different level. And while, yes, the Western world definitely eats way too much livestock, livestock will always have a role to play within any agricultural environment. Um, and it's just a matter of how we manage that. And we can manage our livestock better to from on a local level to farming better with nature, to protecting our waterways, to increasing our biodiversity like we do on our farm with our livestock. We can definitely do all those things. Um, 
We can also learn to eat seasonal with our livestock, which, you know, we've forgotten. If we really wanted to work with the seasons, like we are trying to do like farms, like uh, Crawford's Farm in Tipperary, then dairy is seasonal. You know, you wouldn't have it 12 months of the year. So that's kind of uh, uh, where, we, where we are. But realistically, livestock will always have a role to play within agriculture. And it's just learning to farm better with livestock. And, you know, they are key to, uh, you know, soil, to rice at the end of the day 60 million of the poorest people rely on livestock so again it's a loaded question with a thousand different answers and i could go on but there's no point but in reality yes we need livestock do we need the numbers we have no can we farm it better yes um yeah and i was just going to say that we could probably do an entire webinar our a webinar <laughs> series on um this topic alone so unfortunately we're going to have to leave it there and it's been really great to see like so much activity in the chat and so many questions and answers coming through um i think there's a real appetite for um for this information and you know hopefully we can kind of do more of these things maybe we'll give a break to our very busy farmers um and have have some different panelists in the future as well um but i just want to say a massive thank you to um to all of you for taking time out and for, for sharing the wealth of knowledge that you have um and sharing a little bit of what's going on um in different parts of the country as well. Before we finish up, um, we also have uh, Brian, who's been supporting some of you um, in uh, in the chat uh, with tech issues and different things. Um, Brian also is a wonderful um, poet, and he has written a, a really great piece about food sovereignty. So um, I'm going to hand over to him to in a second, and we'll we'll finish with that. Um, but just a massive thank you to everyone who attended and for all of your your inputs and hopefully we'll, we'll have more of these in the in the future. Um, so Brian, I'm going to hand over to you now. Yeah, sure not. Um, thanks to, to Wayne, Sinead and Fergal and also Sian for, for hosting. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, so I wrote this about two years ago now nearly, um, so hopefully it's still relevant, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll try and go as slow as I can to allow for Zoom. So, the food system, I'm less than impressed with this. It's like the whole world's racing to the precipice, where you don't fight fire with fire, you fight fire with water. But if you follow all the sheep, you'll be lambs to the slaughter. See, it's amazing what can happen when you channel your frustration. You can broaden people's minds, redefine a generation. We need to unify, challenge illegitimate power, expose all the corruption and take back what once is ours. Tell me where have all the commons gone? Last the privatization. But we all crack on like nothing's wrong. We need mass realization. It all comes down to food, the life giving force, but companies see it differently, just a revenue source. Doesn't matter where it comes from, who makes it or how it's made. Doesn't matter if it's flown in, GMO, if it's sprayed. Doesn't matter if the farmers get treated as bad as slaves or the staff working in Tesco get given a living wage. The system's clearly broken. It serves us at the top. We have the power to change it to what we choose and where we shop. You could even grow your own. All you need is a windowsill. Subsidize your shop and shave a little off the bill or form community gardens, find an unused patch of space. You might even grow a community, meet your neighbours face to face. Uh, it seems we've lost our way, food is just something we buy. People still don't seem to get that food sovereignty is about rights. <sighs> See, we've got beef contracts with China, what a great use of our land. Probably, probably lead to factory farming just to keep up with demand. We're addicted to importation, like it's some kind of drug, but keep ignoring the problem and sweep it under the rug. So I'll make it clear, let's call a spade a spade. We're way too dependent on international trade. What will happen in a crisis, and this may be hard to hear, but we all go to the store and find all the shelves are clear. Or worse, if there's a virus that affects popular seed. Guess what? There's no diversity. You can thank short side the greed. Suicidal seeds leave the farmers getting sued. Who the f let poisons companies be in charge of food? And now a message to the marketers. Stop misleading us. Food's supposed to be organic. What's this f you're feeding us? We live in a pale blue dot, but the well has been poisoned. They've modified the crops and the cows are on steroids. It all comes down to money, monopolize the system. We're not customers in this model, more like experimental victims. And I know it's kind of cheesy, but believe me, it's the truth. If you want to see this change, it needs to come from grassroots. That means people like me and you making changes every day. Connect the dots when it comes to food and don't let them lead you astray. Because there's nothing more important if you see the bigger picture. He who controls food controls people. Here ended the lecture. Cheers. Bravo. Thanks a million, Brian. That was uh, yeah. that was really great, and awesome. um, yeah, it's fantastic. And Brian uh, writes 
about all sorts of different topics, a lot of them relating to environmental issues, fossil fuels, different things. Um, and you can find him on Instagram as The Accidental Rapper. Um, and definitely check him out. His stuff is, is just fantastic. It's really, really good. So thanks for sharing, Brian. Um, and thank you to everyone else for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you all soon. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.